Cellular means that they're not made of cells like you or me. Um, so viruses are not living organisms. They are non-living parasites. So they're not technically alive. Um, more of themselves by taking over the cell and then using the cell's machinery um, to assemble more viruses. So uh, that's what's happening in this image that you see. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, so you can't see the image. Oh, uh, that's OK. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the viruses get into a cell, they take over its machinery, and then they use that machinery to make more viruses. So viruses are microscopic particles. They are too small to be seen um, with the kinds of microscopes that we have in the lab. So if, if you look through those microscopes, you're not going to see a virus. <laughs> They're much, much smaller than that. Um, so you would need a, a special microscope. Sure. Called an electron microscope. It's a Chromebook, so yeah, you may need some special attention. OK, so yeah, you'd need a special microscope called an electron microscope to see a virus. And uh, those are pretty expensive, which is why we don't have one in this lab. <laughs> um, so they're, they're so small that even bacteria can get infected by viruses and get sick. Did you know that? Yeah, even bacteria get sick from viruses. Um, so yeah, and viruses can infect lots of things. Anything that's made of cells can actually get a virus. Um, so plants get viruses and get sick. Um, in fact, the, the very first virus that was ever discovered and, and recognized as a virus was the tobacco mosaic virus. It's a virus that makes tobacco plants sick. Um, so yeah, anything with cells can get a virus and get sick. Even if you are just one cell, <laughs> viruses can infect that cell. Um, so of course, animals and people get viruses and get sick as well. So, what is a virus made of then if it's not a cell? So viruses have just two basic components. Um, they have a, a protein shell um, that's not really the same as the cell that the cells that we're made of. So just a little shell made of protein. And then inside they have genetic material, so all their genes. And they might carry those genes on either a little piece of DNA or a closely related molecule called RNA. It's a lot like DNA. So it can also code genes. Um, so uh, viruses can um, take on lots of different shapes. So that little protein shell is called a capsid. Um, and viruses can have different capsid types. Oh, so some of the simpler viruses um, are helical viruses that have like a little spiral-shaped capsid um, with the DNA or RNA inside. Um, there are also viruses that are called polyhedral vi viruses, and those have kind of a, a boxy um, geometric shape to them, um, sort of like a really boxy soccer ball. I, I do have pictures, which I will show you if I can, but, <laughs> but for now I can just describe it to you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> By the way, this, this kind of thing actually happened to me when I was giving my, um, one of my main presentations for my PhD defense. It was pretty horrifying, but I managed to, to get through it. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is no big deal. <laughs> this kind of stuff happens. <laughs> um, so, so the tobacco mosaic virus that infects tobacco plants is one example of a helical virus. So it, it has that, that very simple helical shape, just a spiral of proteins and a little piece of RNA in the middle. Um, the human rhinovirus is an example of a polyhedral vi virus. Um, rhinoviruses are, are those viruses that give you like a common cold. And they're, they're really common. You get rhinoviruses all the time throughout your lifetime. Um, the variola virus is a complex virus. So viruses can have complicated shapes. Um, some viruses even have little projections like legs <laughs> that they use to attach to cells and infect them. They sort of look like a little robot. Um, so yeah, so variola virus is the virus that causes, causes smallpox. And we don't have to worry about smallpox here anymore, or really anywhere anymore, um, because people are, have all been vaccinated for smallpox a long time ago. And, and so smallpox isn't a virus that we get now. Um, but yeah, so the smallpox virus, variola virus, it's, it has a complex shape. Um, some viruses are really sneaky. Um, they actually steal 
uh, pieces of living cells and co cover themselves with those pieces of the living cell as a disguise. Um, so they can be very tricky, and that, that, in that way they can hide. And also those pieces of a living cell give them some more protection from the immune system. So, um, so the coronavirus is actually a complex virus, and it has RNA as its genetic material. Um, and you'll, you'll hear more about the coronavirus from Dr. Carlos. So all viruses are dependent on living cells. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's okay. I can, I can give it without the slides. Okay, so, so all viruses depend on living cells for metabolism and reproduction. So those are, those are two things that living cells can do on their own. They can metabolize, meaning they can take in nutrients and use them for energy, and they can reproduce, meaning they can make more of themselves. So those are two hallmarks of life, and viruses don't have the, those two major characteristics of life. And so that's why they depend on other living cells to provide those things for them. So um, viruses have what we would say is an incomplete genetic code. Um, they don't have all the genes that code for those life processes. Um, so they're, they're missing these vital instructions that let them break down nutrients and reproduce on their own. So when a virus invades a living host cell, um, the virus has access to all that cellular machinery in there. So your cells are kind of like little machines um, with different, um, different pieces inside, like sort of like mini organs, like just like your body has a lot of organs inside. Cells have mini organs inside that carry out all the cell processes. So when a virus gets in, it has access to all those mini organs. And so it can exploit them and uh, get them to work for its benefit. Um, so the basic steps that a virus uses once it gets in the cell are pretty straightforward. So first, first the virus has to attach to the outside of the cell. And then, in the case of human cells and other animal cells, what happens next is um, the virus actually kind of communicates with the cell surface and um, gets the cell to take it inside. So the cell actually kind of willingly takes it in. Um, so it's there. And then the cell actually makes a little pocket, it surrounds it, and takes it inside, <laughs> just like you would eat a bite of something. Um, so cells sometimes eat and drink that way, and so uh, it's, it's a normal thing that a cell would do, um, but it, it doesn't realize that it's taking this virus in. Um, so it takes it inside kind of like a piece of food, and then once the virus is inside, um, enzymes inside the host cell naturally start to break it down or digest it, just like it would another particle. Um, but when that happens, the cell takes the little proteins off, and this little genetic code pops out. Uh, and then that's when trouble starts. So the, the little genetic code is now loose in the cell, and so the cell does what it does with all genetic codes. Uh, it reads it, and it starts using it to put stuff together. It's like, oh, instructions. Hey, hey I'll, I'm going to use them. So it reads the little genetic code just like a blueprint. And it starts to make the things that are encoded there. It starts to produce those things. But the problem is those things are virus particles. And so the cell uses its own machinery to start producing those viral particles. And then it does, the cell does all the work for the virus. It actually starts sticking those things together using the code. So it makes new viruses. It copies the little, then it takes the instructions and makes more of the instructions and puts a set of instructions into each new virus particle. So the cell does all this work for the virus. Um, the virus has tricked it. So the host cell makes many, many more copies of the virus and gets really full of the virus. Um, so the, the new viruses then start to leave the cell. Um, sometimes uh, when the viruses leave the cell, they do so in a way that damages it and breaks open the cell and the particles come, come spilling out uh, and the cell dies. So, so sometimes the cell is sacrificed in this process. It actually sacrifices itself to make these viruses. Um, so yeah, so viruses are, are pretty nasty, <laughs> nasty little items. Um, so yeah, so, so sometimes the cell dies, sometimes not. Sometimes the, the viruses just happily leave and expend the energy of the cell, you know, and then the cell is kind of depleted, but it, it kind of survives and goes on. Um, but yeah, so um, interestingly, not all viruses cause disease. So um, even among the viruses that are able to cause disease, they're not all successful at avoiding your body's 
very sophisticated defense systems. And so um, many times that you have a virus in your body, you don't even know it. Either it's a virus that doesn't cause a disease or it's a virus that your body has overwhelmed and so it doesn't cause any symptoms that you recognize. Um, so disease only happens if the virus reproduces um, enough to sufficiently damage cells. Um, and it has to damage some essential cells in a really direct way for you to start noticing the symptoms. So um, viruses can work in other ways too besides just direct cell damage. They can also um, produce toxic, toxic substances within the cells that they're using. Um, so, and those toxic substances can cause illness. Um, they can also damage the DNA of cells and so by damaging the cell's own code, they disrupt the cell's function. So that can be problematic. Um, so, so whenever viral replication or viral reproduction damages host cells in very significant ways, that's when you start seeing illness. And that damage happens to the tissues that viruses are best suited to infect. So if viruses are um, best suited to infect lung tissue, that's where you're going to see damage, and those are the symptoms that will accompany that virus. So the symptoms you see are a result of a virus damaging tissues directly and disrupting their function. And that, that's when you're sick and you notice things like coughing or sneezing or fever. Um, and so, yeah, so the symptoms are related to viral damage. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carlos, and he's going to tell you more about coronavirus and what it does in the body and give us some, some good facts about the disease. <laughs> yeah, we're on. Okay, yay. <laughs> okay, um, not a lot of time. So what do you have? You have allergies, you have a cold, you have the flu, you have corona, you have Coxsackie. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to talk about the coronavirus. Okay, we got it up on both sides. So... The name, COVID-19, I'm sure you've seen this in the news. The CO stands for Corona, the VI stands for virus, the D stands for disease, and the 19 is for 2019 when we first saw it. And just a little timetable, uh, it's hard to see the writing there, but this virus apparently came out of China, out of Wuhan, which is a city in, in China, out of a seafood and exotic foods market. Uh, three people on December 31 got sick, went to the hospital. Uh, they were there with an atypical pneumonia for a week or so or two. Two went, ho uh, let's see, one, 
Two went home and one died. All right, Chinese scientists were able to isolate the virus and uh, confirm that it was a new virus. Uh, that, and uh, so you follow on down, they made a mistake there. I put in January 24 for France confirms Europe's first case. But before that, on January 11, China announced the first death. On January 13, the World Health Organization reports case in Thailand, which is the first outside China. On January 30, World Health Organization declares the outbreak a global health emergency. Uh, February 2, the first death outside China recorded in the Philippines. So the virus has been moving really pretty quickly. I mean, we're only, what, two, two, and a, two months out in a, in a week or something like that. So China's been working really hard. They've closed off borders uh, to try to contain this virus. Uh, an interesting thing is uh, Thailand, uh, which is just south of China, they get, Thailand gets between 1,200 and 1,400 tourists from Wuhan every day. Okay, so it's just, it's hard. They, they worked hard, but it was hard to contain it. In fact, uh, artificial intelligence and Canadian computers actually predicted the spread of this bug uh, to Thailand and other places before the World Health Organization did. Uh, these are some colors just to kind of show you where the spread is. Now, um, it's hard to tell the difference between the colors of the United States and China, but there is a slight shading difference. Definitely more cases in China. Uh, the darker colors are where you see more of them, and as you get to the lighter co colors, those are less, but this is pretty much worldwide. Now, this is interesting. This slide I put down, uh, this is March 9. Today is March 11. Those of you who are keeping up, these numbers have obviously changed. We now worldwide have more than 115,000 cases. Uh, worldwide, there are 4,200 deaths or fatalities, of which over 3,000 are in China. So in the world, we've got about 1,000 fatalities out of 7 billion people. So um, you can kind of do the math. It's, it's not, it's, 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 something to take care of, but it it's still uh, hasn't hit everybody, obviously. In the U.S., this is an old slide from March 3. So what is this? This is about eight days, nine days, okay, and 121 cases. This morning I saw that in the U.S. so far we have 647 cases, and we have 25 deaths to date this morning in the U.S., Yesterday, I went down to Louisiana. I just learned of the first case in Louisiana. So you see on the color map, Arkansas, uh, the latest I've seen, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Alabama are still free of virus. Uh, but we do have infections in Missouri and Oklahoma and Tennessee, which are the states that are right, right around us. So a picture of the coronavirus, uh, that, this is a two-dimensional picture. It's just, you see a circle with this fuzzy border around it. Uh, it's actually a ball, more like a ball, and, and that fuzzy border are those protein, that protein layer that Dr. Maloney was talking about that is all around it, and it uses those proteins to get into the cell. Um, and that fuzzy border is why they call it corona, because it looks like a crown. Okay, so that's the coronavirus. Uh, this is an electron micrograph of the SARS virus, which is very closely related to the coronavirus. In fact, they share about 60% of the genetic material. And you see the little viral particles there waiting to get into the green, which is an infected cell. Uh, this is a picture of the flu virus. Very similar. It's also a coronavirus. Okay, this is a 19H1N1 influenza, and you see the viral particles there waiting to get into the cell. Uh, this virus, the coronavirus, is similar to the MERS and the SARS that we had in the recent past. In 2003, we had the SARS infection. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Had a fatality rate about 14%. The MERS in 2012, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, had a fatality rate of 35%. In comparison, the coronavirus, which has spread a lot more, has a lower fatality rate, so that's kind of encouraging. Um, Ms. Clark talked about the financial impact, and I know that you've been looking at the news and seen some of this. Uh, supply chains have been disrupted, and so Apple and Nike are not getting their products, so their uh, 
revenues are going to come down. Goldman Sachs had to revise its earnings. Share prices are falling, as you can see from this. Uh, the sale of uh, grain futures, uh, corn and Let's see, corn and canola seem to be holding their own, but soybean and wheat, the prices are coming down, so that's obviously having an effect on the economy. Um, this is from the 9th. You can see the date there two days ago, and stock markets falling. I'm sure you've heard about that. You don't like to see those negative numbers. You like to see positive numbers and growth. I'm sure that you've been aware of the cancellation of Gatherings of large people, sport events around the world are being canceled. It's interesting to look at this. And the SARS virus, it decreased tourism by 3 million people. Uh, financial crisis in 2009, there were 37 million fewer tourists. In 2019, because of this uh, epidemic, uh, 1.46 billion tourists are decreased. And obviously, that adds up to billions and billions of dollars. So how do you tell if it's the cold or the flu um, or corona? And, and it's very, very hard. Uh, flu tends to be more serious than a cold. Uh, as you see there, uh, fever is more common with the influenza, with the flu than with a cold. Aches in the body are more common with influenza than with a cold, chills, and fatigue are more common with the flu and the cold, but you go down a sneezing, stuffy nose, and sore throat, that's more common with a cold than the flu. So you can see a few differences, although it's difficult. The symptoms with coronavirus that have been put out are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Again, fever and cough, you can have with colds. You can have it with pneumonia. You can have it with bronchitis. You can have it with the flu. So that's very nonspecific. You can have shortness of breath with all of those. But if you're in a place where there is coronavirus, then you want to be concerned about that and seek medical attention. Or if you've traveled to a place where you have coronavirus, you want to seek medical attention. So what do you do? Avoid close contact, social distancing. I'm sure you've heard about that. Avoid touching your face. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. What am I doing yesterday when I was down in Louisiana? I, I always go in to see a patient. I like to shake their hand. I started doing a fist bump, okay? And, I, and I, I'm really, I consider myself real good about washing my hands, and, uh, but I increased, I upped that, washing my hands more often. Um, last night, I took a cold shower. Uh, this morning, I drank three glasses of water. So that's what I'm doing. Those, those are things that you can do that can help uh, increase, help your immune system and, and also help you avoid getting this coronavirus. Some of you are going to be traveling, going by bus or going by plane. You're going to be around a lot of people. And you just want to be thinking about this. Again, don't be sh try to avoid shaking hands, avoid touching your face. Uh, you sit down in a plane, there's nothing you can do about that. So... Just uh, do what you can. I want to say just a few words about the flu before, we, uh, before I hand this over to Dr. Kathy, uh, be, just to keep things in perspective. So we saw 115,000 cases worldwide of coronavirus with 4,000 deaths. Just this year, with the flu, since October, we've had 34 million cases. Okay, with about 400,000 people hospitalized and at least 20,000 deaths just from the flu. We're not talking coronavirus, we're talking just the flu. Now, the majority of these cases, the mean age for fatalities on the flu and on coronavirus is like 80 years of age. And it's with people who have chronic conditions, who have, or say, COPD or emphysema or have heart disease or diabetes. Uh, that's where most of the deaths are. The mean age for those who get a serious infection end up in the hospital is 60 years of age. Coronavirus, we don't have any cases under 10 years of age so far that we know. There are some young people that have gotten infected, notably the doctor, one of the doctors that first noted this in, in China who was 34 years old and died. Um, so what do we say to do? For people who are in the high-risk categories, definitely recommend the flu shot. There are problems with the flu shot, but there are problems with having coronavirus also. Um, okay, it's estimated that the flu shot was able to prevent about 6 million flu illnesses, 91,000 
hospitalizations and almost 6,000 deaths. This was in the years 2017 to 2018. What do we have to fight against the flu? We have medications. We, we have foreign medications. And pretty much there's one that's used. And it's only for influenza A and B. There are other coronaviruses that cause flu in addition to the coronavirus thing that's going around now. So we don't really have a lot of medicine. We have some. The best defense against this is a strong immune system. And so Dr. Kathy is going to speak to you about that. I have a short time. I'm going to be very brief so I can get you out on time, but hopefully that you'll know something that will be helpful. So things that will boost your immune, immune system. Actually, if you think of our eight true remedies, it's the proper usage of those. Make sure that when you go to eat, you are choosing some of the deeply colored dark green leafies and orange and yellow fruits and vegetables. Those are the ones that have anti oxidants, they, and they fight the bad. I'm, I wish I had time to give you a story on to understand that better, but just, you'll know, just have to take my word for it here on this. Uh, but another thing that you want to do in eating, and this is a very important thing for right now when we're fighting different infections, cut out sugar, cut out your sweets. Uh, if you think you can't live without it, keep it to an extreme minimum because sugar will lower your immune system like nothing else. That's not something you want to do. Uh, when you th think of getting outside, exercise, exercise is excellent, it helps boost our immune system. But being outside with the sunshine, that also helps by giving you vitamin D, um, that is even better, and you also get your fresh air there that doesn't have, uh, hopefully, people that are coughing in your face or sneezing around, that's, that's droplets, those bring illness. So you want to get your outside time, you want to get your exercise. Now if we think of New Start, the next one would be water. And water does help you fight infection. Drink your water. Dehydration affects your whole body, your, your brain is an important part of your body there <laughs> that is helped, but it's for your health overall, for boosting your immune, you need, you need sufficient water. We mentioned the sunshine. Uh, you need to have, you need to have your uh, night's sleep. That's a very important thing. Many people say, oh, I, I, get, I can get by real fine on five hours. I mean, there are new fascinating studies that are basically telling us in, in these studies that studying your body, studying the bodies of people that are going on little sleep and they say they're doing fine, they're not doing fine. They've gotten themselves accustomed to operating on that lesser amount, but their brain, their body is not functioning well. They are at greater risk for catching things. Get your sleep. Uh, another important thing is, of course, our depending on divine power. But here's something that you might not have thought of. We're at a time here, a time of year that you never know whether it's going to be cold outside or warm outside. Carry a jacket all the time because when you get chilled, you're more vulnerable to infection. So you want to make sure you're covered. Now, I'm going to stop from those and use the last couple of minutes to talk about the hand, foot, mouth, virus, the Coxsackie, what we have going around here on campus right now. You knew that we had uh, an outbreak. First of all, I want to tell you this is usually a child's disease, but adults can get it too. They get in on the fun. It's mild as far as its effects, but that doesn't mean you don't feel sick at the time, and we do want to try to keep it contained. Um, Washing your hands regularly for at least 20 seconds, that's scrubbing between under your nails, give yourself a good hand wash. That is probably one of the biggest 
ways to prevent spread. Um, we are trying to people that have it, uh, we're trying to keep them separate from others. It's a very tricky thing because this virus, you are shedding, you have the virus in you and you can be giving it to others before you get your symptoms. So, you know, just consider it inevitable and you don't need to blame anybody. It's, it's here, it's, uh, I don't know how many of you right now might have the virus, you're shedding it, and in a couple of days, you'll start maybe running a little fever or feeling a sore throat. Uh, the symptoms are not fun, but they're handleable. And uh, some break out in a little rash on, that will affect the hands and feet, but it can be in other places too. Uh, important thing to understand is because of these factors that there's no way to know if you are carrying it right now until it breaks out. We're going to see more of it, but you, you wash your hands well. Now, how long do we, I called the Center for Disease Control. They are the mecca, uh, the ones that have all the information to give you guidelines. And I, I sought out their materials of what do we do here at this school right now at Washita in trying to contain this. Uh, it's known that the virus may remain in you for even a month after, and you still could conceivably share it with someone else, but it's much less. So they still give, children can return to school, uh, adults can return to work or school, whatever they're doing, once all their symptoms have subsided. There should be a full 24 hour period without fever and not having used any Tylenol to, or anything to lower the fever, okay? So if that's, and there's no other symptoms, um, and the rash is dry, um, that's a can go back to class or work um, signal. Yes, it's true that you might be carrying it still for a good long time, but it's less virulent than during the first week. The first, when you first are exposed, your first week is your most spreading time. So wash those hands, wash those hands, wash those hands. Do not, um, coughing and sneezing, you don't wanna be around. If you're coughing and sneezing and you've been sick, you're not ready to be out with people yet because that's spread, that droplet infection into the air, that's, that can spread it rapidly. Um, we would, be delighted to do some question and answer time, except there's not time for it. Uh, can we, if, if someone doesn't have a class and you have a question you'd like to ask, come on up to the front immediately after we dismiss. And I don't know if there's any of our staff that need an answer for something right now that we might have an answer for. Okay, yes. Um, no, we're not, and there's a couple of different reasons. One is uh, most masks are not gonna keep out a virus this small. Uh, that's one major reason, uh, and so it, it becomes a uh, futility to buy masks that keep out viral particles. You're talking expensive things that are not just readily available. So, no, but you should be covering yourself if you, if you have any coughing or sneezing, make sure that you are carrying tissue. And you don't cough or sneeze into your hand. Into your elbow is considered to be the safest place. But then wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Okay. Well, um, we'll have a word of prayer and be dismissed. And again, if anyone has questions, then you can come up to speak to us. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be here where we can study together and come to know you better. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each student and staff member as they go about their day. I pray that we can be wise as serpents and harmless as doves and dealing with the viral illnesses that are going around. Uh, keep us close to you, Lord. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen.
worked out yeah